All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of the Microstructure Exchange. Uh, for those of you who celebrated American Thanksgiving, I hope you had a nice holiday. Uh, but it's good to see you back here. Uh, today, we're, we're very happy to have Marcus Bachhansen presenting on managing relationships in over-the-counter markets. And he's asked um, that uh, we, we take questions in batches. So he'll pause at maybe, maybe two points uh, to, to field questions. Um, and with that, please take it away. Thanks, Josh, and uh, thanks so much for inviting me here today. So I'll be presenting my job market paper on relationships in over-the-counter markets. It's co-authored with David Slot from Danske Bank, who uh, provided the data for the project. So let me start by motivating why I think it's important to study relationships uh, in over-the-counter markets right now. So. A, uh, an important development in these markets in the last uh, decades has been the rise of electronic platforms. And so these are platforms like Market Access and Trade Web, which allow customers to easily contact um, any dealer. The search frictions are, are much uh, smaller now. And paradoxically, um, recent papers have shown that even under this new market structure, customers in over-the-counter markets still rely on relationships with dealers. They still trade with relatively few dealers. And so while these papers have documented that the relationships exist and that they're important, there still is a underlying question is why do they exist? And in particular, given that, you know, with the, um, with the market structure we now have, there's nothing constraining customers to only trade with a few dealers. So that implies that since they still choose to establish these relationships, it must be that relationships between customers and dealers create value, essentially. And that's our first research, research question. And so just to give you a quick preview, we're going to argue that you should view, um, you should view relationships as a repeated game between dealers and customers in particular, we're going to show that if there's a strong relationship between the dealer and the customer, the customer will abstain from excessive quote shopping. This is valuable to the dealer who will reciprocate with better prices, i.e. lower bid ask spreads. So then um, our second question is, well, you know, if, if there's a repeated game between dealers and customers, how is that going to work in certain asset classes where the customer rarely trades? Is it possible to sustain a, a relationship in those cases? And so there we're going to um, ask essentially, well, you know, we know that many of these market participants in these markets, you know, imagine a BlackRock or on the dealer side at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, they're active in many markets. So perhaps they can use trading in other asset classes as a substitution. So essentially, the, the question we're going to ask is, should we really think about these relationships as being defined at the institutional level and not at a within a, 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 an isolated market? And then, so we're going to show that indeed the relationships are defined at the institutional level. And then we're going to ask, well, how does this work in practice? We know that in dealers, employees are quite specialized. You have um, you know, employees with who are specialized in corporate bonds or specialized in foreign exchange. So how does it work in practice that a very specialized employee is incentivized to give better prices to a customer who is not that active in, in that particular asset class? Okay, so we'll be able to uh, answer these questions using a, a great data set. So let me just uh, briefly introduce the data. So it's a proprietary data set from a large European investment bank. In particular, it has four important features. So the first feature is that it includes uh, over 1 million customer requests for quote. It covers different asset classes and currencies. It also has employee data on a trade-by-trade -trade level. And lastly, it has a quite unique measure of the strength of the relationship between the customer and the dealer. So let me give you a little bit more detail about that measure because it's quite important for what we do. So it's, it's a measure that we extract from the dealer's customer management system. And essentially the dealer classifies every customer 
on every on any given day into one of four categories, bronze, silver, gold, and diamond. And so um, conversations with, with the dealer have indicated this is very much a measure of how good the relationship is with the customer. So we're going to use this to, to proxy for the strength of the relationship. And a particular advantage um, of our measure is that, well, in the past, people have used the past trading volume between the customer and dealer to, to proxy for the relationship. So we're going to show that our measure is actually uh, has a strong explanatory power with respect to bid-ask spreads, even after controlling for a customer's past volume. Now, um, let me give you an overview of, of our findings. So our first important finding is that relationships do create value both for the customer and the dealer. And here we test two mechanisms. The first mechanism is an adverse selection mechanism, which essentially says that um, relationship customers are uninformed and therefore they go to their relationship dealer who can identify them as uninformed and provide better prices. The second me mechanism we test is a what we call a moral hazard mechanism where dealers are concerned about customers um, receiving too many quotes, essentially excessive quote shopping. And then the relationship is a, essentially a a uh, way to incentivize customers not to do this and to provide better prices to those customers who don't um, collect too many quotes. So the evidence is consistent with the moral hazard story, and we don't find any evidence for uh, the adverse selection story. So indeed, we do find that if there's a strong relationship between the dealer and the customer, the customer will tend to conduct less quote shopping, will provide evidence that this is valuable to the dealer will then respond by quoting better prices to these customers. So our next finding is then going to look at how these relationships are defined. And again, you know, um, coming back to this idea that while well, some customers will, will only trade certain assets relatively infrequently, so how can they sort of keep up this uh, repeated game equilibrium? So we're gonna show that actually um, we should really think of, of these relationships as being between institutions and not specific to any asset class. We're going to show that by highlighting that um, when a customer trades a new asset class for the first time, having previously traded, you know, let's say has been, been very active in corporate bonds, then we're going to look at if for the first time they trade foreign exchange, and we're going to show that they immediately benefit from the reputation that they established from those other asset classes. And to, to hammer this point home, we're also gonna use a, a uh, separate data set that's just gonna be for, for this point um, from uh, on basically the trading partners of, of European investment companies. And we're gonna show that there's evidence that customers internalize this effect by trading with the same few dealers in every asset class. So essentially, uh, empirically, we'll find that if BlackRock trades a lot with Goldman Sachs and corporate bonds they also tend to trade a lot with um, Goldman Sachs and foreign exchange. And so the, the last finding we have is related to, well, how is this managed uh, in practice and, and in particular on the dealer side? We know that the uh, employees of dealers are highly specialized, but what we document is that there's a specific type of employee called uh, a salesperson who manages these cross-asset relationships. So we're gonna provide evidence that this type of employee is really intermediating between customers and these specialized employees within the dealer. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip the, the literature review. And so let me just give you the, the overview of the, of the rest of the talk. So first, I'll just briefly give you some, some stylized facts about dealer-customer relationships just to fix ideas. Uh, then I'll give you some more detail on the, on the data that we use, particularly the, the trade-level data. And then we'll have our three findings. Um, first of all, we'll look at, well, do these relationships actually create value both for the customer and the dealer? Then we'll look at, should we think of these relationships as being defined at the asset level or at the institution level? And then lastly, we'll look at having shown that uh, there are indeed cross-asset class effects, 
how are those types of relationships managed in practice? So first, let's look at um, some stylized facts. So, so here we'll rely on, um, on a hand-collected data set that was um, publicized after MIFID II, which required um, every European investment company to report their uh, top five most important um, counterparties within each asset class. So we hand collect this data and let me just show you an example of an observation to give you a better idea. So this is uh, an observation from the investment firm Eaton Vance. And so here we can see who did they trade with in credit derivatives in 2020. And we can see they uh, mostly transacted with um, Citigroup. So we use this data just to give, you know, um, it basically three stylized facts on, on what we see, especially under this new market structure, whether relationships indeed are, are a prominent feature. So the, the first two stylized facts are have been well documented by others. So I'll go through those quite quickly. The first fact is just that most customers get the vast majority of their trading with just a few dealers. And remember that these are, you know, large um, institutional companies, they're not retail traders, so they certainly would be able to access many dealers, but they choose to just rely on a few. The, the second fact is that the trading con connections between customers and dealers are persistent. So essentially, if a customer and a dealer have traded together in one year, they are highly likely to trade again in the next year. The, the third fact is, uh, to the best of our knowledge, new. So here we look across different asset classes and we show that customers tend to concentrate their trading with dealers um, across these asset classes. So in practice, it means that if a customer is trading a lot with a dealer in one asset class, they'll also um, trade with that dealer in, in other asset classes. Okay, so we've you know, established that even you know, after the rise of electronic platforms, relationships are important. So now we really understand, want to understand, well, why? So here we'll need a, a trade level data set, um, which I'll now give you some, some details on. So it's a proprietary data set from a, from a European investment bank, and it covers every single request for quote uh, that their fixed income department received from 2018 to 2022. And in particular, what's important to note is that it covers um, five different asset classes, such as both corporate bonds, government bonds, and mortgages, and also covers different currencies. So let me give you an example of the uh, observation. It'll be a little bit more clear. So this was a a request that was received in uh, April 2022 for a German government bond. So we can see the uh, anonymous customer ID. And we can also see the um, customer ranking. So this was the bronze, silver, gold, or um, diamond, which group the customer at that time belonged to. We can see the size of the request. We can see how many other dealers were um, participating in this RFQ. And then we can see the response from the side of our dealer. So in this case, they did provide a quote. So the dealers don't always have to, um, to actually respond. We can see the quote that they um, provided. We can also see the prevailing mid price. And then based on the difference between the two, we can calculate the bid ask spread. And so in this case, um, the customer ended up selling to our dealer. And in, in those cases where our dealer provided the best price, we can also see the second best price from the other dealers, which is called the, the cover price, which we'll use uh, later. Okay, so you know, since we will really use this ranking variable to, to as a measure of the strength of the relationship, maybe it's worth just spending a little bit more time giving you some more a detail on this, this measure. So it's a subjective measure set by the customer's um, salesperson. I'll, I'll get back to you know, the role of these, uh, these salespeople. They're essentially a relationship manager. The important point, point is that it's not a, uh, a mechanical measure uh, you know, that can, can be expressed as a formula. 
And although we do find that it's uh, positively correlated with, with the trading volume, uh, even after accounting for the trading volume, there's still significant variation. And so uh, in particular, what, what I you know, should, should mention that if we compare to, to the previous proxy that people use the trading volume, what's nice about this one in particular is that it's available on a daily basis, whereas uh, the trading volume, people tended to calculate that on a, on a quarterly basis. So our measure is, is arguably um, significantly less noisy. And so just as a first check um, and, and corroborating with, with what people have previously found, we'll look at, are there differences in the bid ask spreads that the, that the different customers receive depending on their ranking? So the regression we're gonna run, I'll just spend a little bit of time on it because that will be sort of the general specification we'll use. We're gonna have the spread, the bid ask spread on the specific trade on the left-hand side. So this is a trade by trade regression. And then on the right hand side, here we're gonna have dummy variables for um, the specific ranking that the customer who sent that RFQ ha had. We're gonna control for the uh, request trade side, trade size and the amount of the number of bidders, i.e. The, the, you know, how many other dealers were competing on this RFQ. And we're also gonna include here a day times bond and uh, RFQ platform fixed effects. So the platform is just, you know, whether the request came from trade web or market access or so on. So the results are, are shown in the, in the figure below. So this is the difference in the bid ask spread for a um, customer category relative to the, to the lowest ranking, which is bronze. So we can see, for example, that diamond rated customers on average receive a 65% lower bid ask spread than a bronze customer. So it's quite significant reduction in, in transaction costs that the higher rated customers receive. Okay, and just you know, for the rest of the talk, given that in, you know, based on this figure, the effect looks to be more or less linear, just for simplicity, we're gonna use a, a linear transformation of the variable um, yeah, just for ease of interpretation. And so maybe this would be a good time just to take a few questions, if there are any. Sounds good. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the chat. So if anyone has a question, uh, please just go ahead and your, raise your hand. Maybe, maybe while we're waiting for people to, to come up with questions, I'll, I'll actually ask one uh, myself, Marcus, if that's all right. So you, you were mentioning your introduction that the way that surplus gets created is by deterring excessive quote shopping. Uh -huh. can, can you just say a little bit more about where exactly you think of that surplus is coming from? Or in other words, what is the cost that excessive quote shopping incurs? Yeah, so I think you can you can motivate that in a number of ways. So one way would be, you know, related to, to your uh, recent paper would be, well, if the dealer is concerned about um, you know, predator, predatory trading from other dealers, they don't want to, you know, um, trade and then have all other dealers know about it. Um, so there are also, a, a, you know, a number of uh, recent theory papers that have thought about if it's costly for the dealer to provide service or sort of a fixed cost component. So there we could also think that, well, the dealer doesn't want to incur that fixed cost if, you know, if it's very unlikely to trade with the customer because they're requesting quotes from so many other dealers. So that's sort of the way I think about it, but we don't have a, you know, if, I think there are, there are different ways to, to invoke that cost. Makes sense. And in the meantime, now I see we have some hands. So uh, go ahead and. Hi, um, hi my name is B. Uh, I was just wondering if you have equity in your asset classes and um, I'm also wondering, um, so there were papers that found significant relationships in the dealer and customer relationships in the in the bond market. Um, so what, dif how different is this paper uh, compared to the previous ones? Thank you. Yeah, so um, we don't have any equity trades. So th these are purely fixed income, fixed income assets. Uh, the second part of your question, sorry, I didn't quite catch you. You mentioned there are other papers who, who do what, sorry? Yeah, so like the uh, papers that you show in the literature, like Hendershot and uh, so, um, 
they have found like um at least in the mortgage uh oh no uh, sorry um a municipal bonds that uh, the relationship between the dealer and the customers uh using like a sort of a network uh, measure uh, is significant to the 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 bit as spread significantly negatively of course yeah. So, so indeed, uh, yeah, there are, of course, uh, a literature that look at, at networks and over-the-counter markets. I think that that is not going to play an important role in this setting because so our data is only coming from electronic platforms where it's actually quite easy for a customer to contact any dealer. So I think it's a reasonable assumption that for the customers in our data, they more or less have the same network and can, can contact any dealer. So we're really trying to understand where is the value being created, uh, you know, above and beyond any any network effects? And and again, you know, the previous literature has documented that these relationships exist and they have an impact on bid ask spreads, but it's still unclear um, where that value is coming from. I have sort of related thoughts and questions. I, I like the framing and I love the data and the work. It would strike me that sitting somewhere behind this is is a search model from the point of view uh, uh, like you say they can access any dealer i still think there's going to be a bit of a search model here with time as being one dimension and so what they're doing is solving a, a sort of bilateral search model and so as i looked at the results i thought of this almost as a limit wage kind of example where they know you could search and get a slightly better price so they give you just enough of a discount so to prevent you from engaging in that search and finding a slightly better price. Just like in the limit wage uh, literature, I pay you a slightly higher wage just to keep you from searching for a better job. Did you explore some of the sort of cross-sectional implications of a search model? For example, I would guess that this is more common in fixed income than equities. I would guess that those who trade more infrequently would be the ones who more value the ability to avoid a search. Thank you. Um, yeah, so interesting question. I think, you know, the, the first thing to recall is just that on these RFQs, you know, the dealer is, is competing with, with other dealers. So perhaps the, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to charge a, a rent quite in the same type of way as, as you would see in search models. I think, you know, certainly search frictions are much lower in these markets, but I agree that, you know, of course, there's limits to how easily customers can contact, you know, virtually any dealer out there. So indeed, there is a there is a probably an inherent trade off between um, the customer going out, you know, going out of its way to contact many dealers and the and their dealer wanting to incentivizing the, the customer not to do that. Okay, and, and then we also have a couple of questions in the chat, um, maybe just in the interest of time so we don't get too hung up on questions, we'll just do the ones that are quick questions of clarification. Um, so, so one question is, uh, do customers know their classification, this bronze, silver, gold, diamond? Uh, yes, uh, to my understanding, indeed, the customers are aware of their, are aware of their uh, classification. Okay, and then another question was, um, is bid ask spread the only measure of value? For instance, can you observe how much time an order takes to execute? Um, so we looked also at one other measure, which is just whether the dealer um, responds or not to the to the request. And there we find uh, you know very similar results. So the higher ranked uh, the customer is, the more likely the dealer is to to respond to the request. Um, which again, you know, we, you would imagine is, is valuable for the customer, which would because that would imply uh, smaller uh, trading delays. Okay, and then um, finally, regarding the trading protocol, when a dealer responds to a request, does it know how many bidders are competing? Yeah, so thanks for that question. Indeed, on the specific RFQ, the dealer can see how many other um, dealers have been solicited. So the point that we're going to make is that. There is a observable component, which which was what I just mentioned, and then there's unobservable, which is that the dealer cannot see if the customer on the side or secretly, for example, has run uh, another RFQ or 
just before running that RFQ, solicited a quote from other dealers. So that's that's the sort of the where the moral hazard problem comes in. Okay, great. Uh, so in the interest of time, I think we should probably get back to the slides. Um, okay. Hans, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped over your question, but maybe if there's time, we can circle back to that at the end. Sure, sounds good. Okay, so just to, to get back to, to where we were, so we've sort of documented that these relationships exist. So now let's look at, well, how is this value created? Okay, so we're going to test two hypotheses. The first hypothesis, which I think is more um, arguably you know, prevalent you know, from, from the literature, is adverse selection theory. So here, this theory would say that, well, some customers are uninformed. These customers would like to go to their relationship dealer, who would then identify them as uninformed based on their past history, and would provide them with a better price. The second hypothesis is going to be a moral hazard hypothesis. This is going to say essentially that the dealer does not cannot perfectly observe how many quotes the customer received. The dealer would prefer the customer to receive as few uh, quotes as possible, and we can motivate this, you know, due to the risk of friend running from other dealers or due to service costs. So um, let's first try to test the adverse selection theory. So we're gonna test this by measuring the price impact on every trade. So essentially, we're gonna look at the mid quote at the time of the trade and then compare it to the mid price at the end of the day, the following day. So essentially, we're gonna measure whether, um, whether the trade was based on private information. And so, and just as a robustness checks, because obviously these uh, price impact can be noisy, we're also gonna compute an adjusted version where instead of uh, looking at the price change in the asset itself, we're gonna compare it to a corresponding government bond, essentially viewing the asset as a, as a spread to, uh, to a government bond yield. Okay, and then we're gonna run a regression where on the left-hand side, we're gonna have the price impact on the trade. And on the right-hand side, we're gonna have the relationship ranking. So let's look at the results. So here, the first row is, is, is the important one. And so what we see is that there is no statistically significant relationship between um, relationships and price impact. That is, is not the case that if there's a stronger relationship between the customer and the dealer, that the trades of that customer tend to be um, you know, less, less informed, essentially. So that leads us to the, um, to the second hypothesis, the moral hazard or excessive quote shopping uh, hypothesis. So as I mentioned, although on a given RFQ, the dealer can see how many is participating in that RFQ, a customer has different ways actually to contact additional dealers. So for example, one way uh, this would be done in practice is using another platform, or you could also uh, request quotes um, bilaterally you know, through, through the phone or through chat. And the dealer, of course, participating in the RFQ cannot observe this. And so on the customer side, they you know, ideally would like to receive as many quotes as possible, just giving them you know, a greater var variety of quotes, but it's costly for the dealer because well, if, they're, if, you know, if many other dealers has, have, have seen this request, it might make it more difficult for the dealer to unload its, event, its inventory. So the way we're gonna test this is through three empirical tests. So first, we're going to verify that uh, based on the observable part of the number of dealers participating in RFQ, there's a link between that and the bid ask spreads. Indeed, we're going we're gonna to test, well, does the dealer provide a worse price if it's competing against many dealers? Then we're going to test, do we have evidence that uh, relationship customers trade more rarely having sent an RFQ. So the intuition here is that if a customer is sending a lot of requests, but rarely trading on those requests, they're probably also sending requests to other dealers and trading on those. And then lastly, of course, this only matters for dealers if they actually face some sort of cost. And we're gonna measure this cost um, basically as a as an amount of overbidding where we're gonna look at the difference between the traded price, so the cases where our dealer provided the best price, and the second best bid. And we're gonna 
um, you know, interpret that as a measure of, of, the, of the dealer's overbidding and see whether that's correlated with the relationship ranking. So the, the uh, regression specification is going to be more or less what we saw previously, where we're going to have a uh, variable on the left-hand side, and then we're going to have the relationship ranking on the, on the right-hand side. So let's look at the results. So if we focus on the first column first, here we have the spread on the left-hand side and the number of observable bidders on the right-hand side. So we see that the more dealers are competing on our RFQ, the wider the spread the dealer provides. That provides some evidence that the dealer is indeed concerned about, you know, um, front running from other dealers or, um, or you know, a, a service cost that is not going to, a, to uh, recuperate. In the second column, we have a dummy variable for whether the trade, uh, sorry, whether the request results in a trade with any dealer. And so here we find the variable of interest here is the relationship ranking. So we find that the higher rank the customer is, the more likely they are to trade uh, on a given request. And then lastly, as a consequence to the dealer, we look at uh, overbidding. So essentially when they do trade with a, with a customer with a weaker relationship who has you know, conducted a lot of quote shopping, does that mean that you know, essentially the dealer will only win the trade when all the other dealers are providing quite low bids? And we find that this is the case, that, um, well, the interpretation here is that the higher the relationship ranking is, the lower the amount of, of overbidding. Okay, so let me just take, take stock of where we are. So we've provided evidence that indeed relationships create value both for the customer and the dealer. We've argued that it's not due to a adverse selection story, but rather a, a moral hazard um, um, mechanism. So now we're going to explore at, well, how is it possible for uh, institutions to sustain a relationship even if in some asset classes, trading is relatively infrequent. Because of course, underlying this um, repeated game idea is that, well, I mean, they have to interact at a certain frequency uh, in order to actually sustain this equilibrium. So in our data set, we, um, we, it covers different asset classes and indeed the medium cu customers is active in, in different asset classes and actually the higher the relationship ranking is, the more asset classes that the customer will tend to be active in. So some, um, you know, a way of motivating why, you know, why, why would we even think that actually these uh, relationships are defined on an institutional level? Well, first of all, our measure is, is, is the thing for, for one customer. It's not specific to the asset class. And remember also that our third stylized facts show that if you look across asset classes, Customers tend to trade with the same dealers in every different asset class. So that might indicate that, well, actually, you know, uh, participants in these markets are able to internalize trading they do in every different asset class and, and sum it up to, you know, to one specific uh, relationship between the two institutions. So we're going to ask, should we really think of these relationships as being defined at an institution level? So let me show you how we test for this. So we're going to identify times where a customer starts trading a new asset class. So you know, imagine some customer who is very active in corporate bonds, has a high relationship ranking, and suddenly starts trading mortgages. Specifically, we'll define a dummy variable, which is just equal to one in that quarter within that new asset class when the, when the customer starts becoming active. And so the regression we're going to run is really quite similar to, to uh, the, the previous regression. Here, we're just going to interact the relationship ranking with this dummy variable. The intuition being that the relationship variable is obviously, um, you know, has been, is dependent on their trading in the, in the old asset classes, right? Because they just try, started trading this new asset class. So, um, if they if they immediately receive discounts, even though they you know just started trading this asset class, 
that would be evidence that indeed these relationships are really defined at the institutional level. So let's look at the results. So what we find is that when we interact the relationship variable with this new client, new client dummy, we find indeed that although the effect is, is somewhat smaller than, than what we saw before, indeed these, um, these customers immediately get a around um, five to 6% reduction in bid ask spreads when they start trading a new asset class. So they benefit from the, the status they, they obtain from their previous trading. Okay. So let me just check the time. Um, so perhaps that would be, this would be a good time to take just a few other questions. Uh, no new questions in the chat since our last break, uh, but if anyone has any questions, you know, again, please raise your hand. Okay, well, maybe maybe at this point we we could circle yep. back to a. Oh, so was there a? Because oh. we we could circle back to the question that Hans asked earlier. Uh, so Hans, I don't know if you if you would like to unmute yourself. Otherwise, I can I can just read your question. All right. Um, so so Hans asks, you know, should we? So th this is you're relating to one of those graphs that that you were showing earlier. Uh, Hans asks, should we be surprised that customers? Or classified as preferred customers get better deals. After all, it is a subjective measure and they use the classification across the firm. Um, and, and then maybe building on that, maybe you could say a little bit more about how this classification metric is determined and you know how it's set. Sure. So, I mean, I personally am not surprised given that there are quite a number of papers that have shown different asset classes that if there's a relationship between the dealer and the customer, um, the customer gets better prices. And so the, the effect that we find here is actually even stronger than in previous papers. And I think the reason is that our measure can uh, encompass you know, the, the trading volume between the dealer and the customer, but can also, can also encompass other things, you know, as we've argued, for example, capture how much quote shopping the um, the customer is is conducting, which obviously you you can't see that just based on the the, the the trading volume. So how the 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 measure is set? So actually that'll be a little bit related to the next section. So it's a it's a it's a subjective measure, and in particular, so each customer has a a salesperson who's sort of a relationship manager, and um, what's interesting is the the salesperson really monitors the customers trading across different asset classes. And based on that, they will, they will rank the customer. Um, you know, the, the dealer has told us that it's you know, definitely influenced by their expectation of how much future business they do with the customer. And uh, yeah, yeah, so that's, that's more or less what I can say. Uh, Josh, I think you're muted. Sorry, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, we we just got a couple of new questions in the chat. Uh, Adamar, would you like to ask your question live or, or I, I can also read it? Uh, yeah, hi. So my question is like, do you observe uh, customers transitioning from a bronze to a gold to a platinum or being demoted from a higher class to a lower class and what would be the determinants of such a transition for a particular customer so yeah yeah so indeed we we do observe that in in our data that there, there is some a variation over time um so in, in some of our regressions um we include customer fixed effects so there we're actually relying on you know the the variation within customers so the, the results of, that we have provided um, you know, do hold up when, when using customer fixed effects. So there the interpretation should really be that you know, over time, a customer will be upgraded or downgraded based on, on for example, their, their trading frequency. But indeed the, the dynamics of these relationships is something on, in our, on our to-do list really to, 
to uh, to underpin the dynamics between all these variables. Yeah, thanks. And then um, Peter Lerner asks the the game theoretic aspects of the relationship was mentioned in the introduction, um, but was not followed up on. So may maybe you could say a little bit more about kind of how, how you're thinking about this in terms of a, of a repeated game. Sure. I mean, so we argue that uh, the, the, the quote shopping conducted by the, the customer should be essentially viewed as a, as a hidden action. So we would argue that these relationships are you know, relational contracts between the customer and the dealer. On the customer side, um, they, they, they commit to not um, conduct excessive quote shopping, and then the dealer uh, reciprocates by, by providing um, um, better prices, smaller bid-ask spreads. And so that's that's the way we we think about. It. Of course, I mean we 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 don't have a, a theoretical model in the paper. Um, yeah, that's that is our that's our our view of it essentially. So I guess related to that, um, you know, it seems to me that if if you were to sustain this equilibrium, the different players would have to be able to detect deviations, uh, you know, from from their their counterparties in order to then be able to punish those deviations. You know, if, if we want to sustain this as an equilibrium. So how how in in this setting would a dealer detect excessive quote shopping from a particular customer? Yeah, so there the 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 important variable is the trading frequency of the customer. So essentially, imagine you know a um, a diamond customer who trades on ninety percent of their requests and then suddenly you know decreases to forty percent. Well, then the dealer should infer. I mean, even though that's a noisy measure, they should infer that, well, that, that could be a, a signal that the customer is actually sending out more requests than, that, than what they're indicating, and then they're trading on those requests. And that's, that's really why the, their trading, trading frequency has, has decreased. That makes sense. And then we have one last question in the chat, I think, from Ingrid Warner. I'll read that, and then maybe we can get back to the slides. Um, the question is, how easy or hard is it for customers to carry out best execution analysis ex post? Um, well, that's that's a good question. I think it depends a little bit on how sophisticated the, the customer is. Um, I think it's, it's, on average, is not straightforward. You know, given these OTC markets, we don't have um, you know, firm prices like on an exchange. So indeed, it's very much relying on, um, you know, and sense on, on one hand on, on trusting sort of indicative prices. And on the other hand, there's probably also a, a relationship element to that where they, just the customer to some extent has to trust the dealer that, that they do provide better prices. But I guess our, you know, our analysis uh, confirms that indeed the, the better ranked customers do receive substantially better prices. So uh, yeah, I guess that's uh, good to see. If, if I could follow up on Ingrid's question, and, and, and I'm just struggling with the framing of this as a contract where they don't look at quotes. It does seem to me that they could send regularly 5% or 10% of their volume to others. And that in essentially they're monitoring what they could get if they established relationships with other um, dealers. So it, it it seems, I think I'm with Josh, that it seems a big step to say that this is a contract where they don't shop. I have a feeling that they're probably always shopping and they stick with you so long as their indications are that you're giving them a better price. So, yeah, I mean, I don't want to take a too hard stance. I think the point here is that there's a, a level of shopping that is that is implicit. Of course, you know a customer will from time to time probably check whether uh, you know the prices provided are reasonable. What I'm talking about are customers who, on every single trade, let's say you know for for every trade they want to make, they're going to send out many requests, really sampling you know all possible dealers, while indicating you know while while giving the impression perhaps that they're they're not doing that. So I think there are many degrees to 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 which the customer can engage in this, and from the dealer side, they obviously want to avoid that the that the the customer is really excessively uh, shopping for quotes. 
So perhaps just in the interest of time, I should uh, finish the last section and then, or at least, you know, briefly maybe cover the, the last section. Yeah. Sorry, maybe just a comment on that. I mean, just to, to aid you, um, because I'm not quite sure how easy it really is for customers to shop around. It depends a little bit on the size of the customer in general, I think, because in the end, and maybe tell me if I'm wrong, but I've recently come across this in another paper that looks at FX uh, market that on these requests for quote platforms, while you may be able to send around quotes, many dealers would not um, send anything because for a small client, they would need to have an established sort of credit line with them because following up then on the trade, you know, you have to settle the trade. And I mean, I don't think that, you know, the that the, at the platform here does any of the um, customer checks on the credit worthiness and all these kinds of things that you need to do, you know, the first time that you actually trade with someone. So it's not so easy to just send around, you know, 5% of, oh, yeah, actually, Hannes just had his end up because it's, I'm referring to this paper. Um, so it's not so easy, you know, for, for clients to shop around um, because for that, they already sort of need to have an established relationship with, um, with, the, with the dealer to begin with. That's all that I wanted to say on that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that comment. I think maybe the, the context here is a little bit different since, you know, in foreign exchange markets, you have many, um, well, they could be even retail customers or, or corporate clients, whereas in, 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 in fixed income markets in this data set, the clients are going to be mostly, you know, large institutional clients, pension funds, hedge funds. So for them, you know, these types of barriers as sort of credit checks and so on is it's it's going to be a much smaller, much smaller barrier, and especially because uh, the assets are mostly bonds, which, you know, that's easy to settle. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't think that should be an impediment to, to customers seeking out quotes. Um, OK, so maybe I'll just briefly go through the, the last section just to give you a flavor of, of those results and then we can we can um, go through the remaining questions at the end, if that's okay with everybody. So just to take stock of where we are, so we've argued that actually these relationships are, are defined at the institution level. So now we're gonna ask, well, how does it work in practice that we know that um, employees at dealers are quite specialized? So really in, in practice, how is a corporate bond trader? So a trader here is a employee at the dealer, how is he incentivized to give discounts to a customer who mainly trades mortgages and is not important to the corporate bond department? So here we're going to uncover the role of salespeople. So a, sales a salesperson in um, investment banking is somebody who is responsible for managing the, the customer, managing the relationship with the customer. And so in practice, these salespeople intermediate between the customers and, um, and the traders within the dealer. And so let me try to give you a, a sort of a figure um, of, of what the mechanism that we have in mind. So consider this salesperson who has two customers. The first customer mainly trades corporate bonds and very infrequently trades mortgages while the second customer um, trades a lot of mortgages and, and infrequently trades corporate bonds. So essentially, the way that the corporate bond trader is incentivized to provide good prices to the blue customer who rarely trades with him is that, well, that customer has a salesperson who through their other customer is an important, um, has, a, has a strong tie to that customer. So let's look at um, you know, how the network looks in the data. And so this is plotting the five most important salespeople in our data. Maybe I should just mention you know, the, the way this appears in our data is we can see on a trade by trade basis, who is the trader. So the trader is the employee of the dealer and who is the salesperson on that trade. So in this figure, the, the black dots are, are salespeople. The gray dots are customers, and the color dots in the middle are traders in different asset classes. So as you can see, most customers are assigned to just one salesperson. But importantly, the salespeople really have ties to every single asset class. So even if a customer 
is not trading you know, a lot with corporate bonds, it's likely, especially if they're an important customer, that they'll be connected to a salesperson who has quite strong ties to that asset class. So the way we're going to test you know, whether this mechanism is important in practice is we're going to measure the relationship between the salesperson and the trader. So we're, here we're just going to look um, for a given pair of a salesperson and trader, what was the trading volume between those two in the past quarter? And so the, 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 the intuition here is that, well, a customer you know, might individually not be important to you know, a government bond trader, but their salesperson through all that salesperson's other customers could have very strong ties to, to that asset class. So the regression we're going to run is relatively similar to before, but here we're going to use a measure of the relationship between the sales and the trader and interact that with the uh, relationship ranking. So essentially what we're testing here is, is it the case that when you know a customer uh, is highly ranked, do they need for their salesperson to have a strong tie to their trader in order to get a, a price discount? So let's look at the results. So if we focus on the, on the third column, we see that indeed the price discounts that customer gets, so the, um, the, the reduction in bid ask spreads is significantly stronger if their salesperson have strong ties to, to the trader. So that corroborates this, this, um, this mechanism that we, that we described. Okay, so I think I'm uh, more or less out of time. So let me conclude. So we um, provided evidence that these relationships actually create value for both the dealer and the customer, and that uh, the value created is, is based on the concern of excessive quote shopping, which can be alle alleviated with, with relationships. We also show that these relationships are actually defined at the institution level and are managed by dealer salespeople. And just to give you some a few implications of our findings, first of all, our findings imply that it actually can be optimal for customers to just trade with the same few dealers in every market. And of course, this has um, quite some implications for empirical research where we tend to have data just from one asset class and sometimes interpret as trade as a, as a spot trade. And here that could be misleading, at least that's the implication from our results. Because what could be suboptimal, you know, uh, um, within one asset class might make sense when you see the whole picture. You could imagine, you know, customers trading a lot with a dealer in one asset class to ensure that they get a strong relationship, which will then benefit them in other asset class. And lastly, this might also provide an explanation for why in practice we see banks, i.e. dealers, as being global and being active in all asset classes, essentially. Indeed, they have to do this if they want to establish these um, cross-asset class relationships, which, uh, which we provide evidence for are, are important in the data. So thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to, to answering any more questions you may have. All right, well, thanks a lot, Marcus, for an interesting talk. Um, at this point, let's, uh, let's open it up for questions. Um, our official time ends at the top of the hour, but Marcus has uh, generously, generously offered to stick around for as long as people have questions so we can we can go past them. Um, Hi, I, I see you have the first hand, so why don't you lead things off? And then if other people have questions, please raise your hand as well. So hi, Marcus. Uh, uh, very nice talk, very interesting. I learned a lot, thanks. Um, so my question is, so you're telling the small hazard story, but from the story that you're telling, the main beneficiary of the relationship is the dealer. I'm wondering as a client, from the client's perspective, I'm going on this platform just to impose competition. And the, my, my prior belief would be that uh, clients want to uh, want competitive prices and want to foster dealer competition on these platforms. And why is the dealer not playing an auction strategy in which a dealer is bit shading and and uh, trying to increase markups as much as possible in this market. Thanks. 
So, I mean, the, the way I interpret our results is indeed um, the, the dealer benefits because uh, the customer does, you know, if there's a relationship, the, the customer does less quote shopping, but the, the customer certainly also benefits by receiving vastly uh, superior prices, right? The bid-ask spread is much smaller. And so I think, you know, in terms of competition, the, the relationships are not stipulated by the fact that, you know, the, 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 um, the customer can only go to this dealer. They can still, you know, they can still request quotes from, 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 from other dealers within the RFQ. So it's really the, the hidden part where the dealer wants to know how many, how many other dealers they're competing against, and they don't want the customer to claim to contact few dealers and then secretly contacting a lot. I hope that that answers your question. So I was wondering, sorry, one, once more, I was wondering, so when you think about a simple bad raw competition, you have one good, say, the German uh, Bund that you have shown, the German Bund Bund, and you need two dealers to have zero markups in a bad raw competition. Why is this not happening? Because I, as a, as a competitor, have the incentive to send a quote which is just below your quote and win the auction. Why is, why is this sort of competition not happening in the first place? What is the underlying friction? So, so you're asking why? I mean, why the bid ask spreads are not um, zero, essentially, or just to understand. So, uh, I mean, I don't know whether it's a bid ask spread or that they quote only on one side. Uh, is it two sided thing? I mean, I don't know it. I'm, I'm wondering. Uh, I'm yeah. Okay, so I so, think so. Yeah. When when there's lots of competition, then then markups should be uh, should be lower. I mean, this is the goal. This is the idea of competition. Right. So you look at the natural counterparty that can offer you first in a competitive market low spreads and second has better quoting ability and provide you more favorable prices. So you have you have these benefits of competition. And I'm wondering why is the customer not seeking these benefits of competition? Um, so I mean our, our empirical specification, your sort of our analysis was done on a holding fix the bond on the same day and then comparing prices. So in that sense, it's hard for us to say something specifically about markups. And just because we observe a, a non-zero bid ask spread, that could be a compensation for, you know, for many different components on the on the behalf of the dealer. So I don't think um, you know I don't think we can deduce from that that you know dealers are are charging rents. Um, but yeah, but I appreciate your, your comment about sort of how this interacts with, with competition. And that's, that's actually something we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, looking at asset classes where competition is, is higher and whether the effects are stronger there. So that's something we should look at. Thanks. Ingrid, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I'm uh, no camera on. I'm sitting here with a dog in my lap, <laughs> not very serious looking. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on my question, which is somewhat related to the previous question of Hannes, which is, you know, when the customers look at this market, what do they see and how do they evaluate best execution? Just so I understand, there's is there no trace data equivalent so there's uh, an ability to follow up to to examine uh, the execution quality and compare uh, what hedge fund A is getting compared to other uh, participants in the market uh well to you know answer your your question directly uh, the, the data is from european markets post 2018 so that's after you know the the mifid 2 regime is in place. So in theory, there should be trade reporting. I think as far as I understand, there's been some implementation um, issues. So that is not really comparable to you know, the trade system that, that that's in effect in the US. Um, so indeed, it's not straightforward to customers to, to directly measure their, their execution quality. So again, you know, our sort of our uh, results rely on the idea that well we're just comparing 
two prices, two bid ask spreads set for the same asset on the same day, and then we can say something about which one is is larger. So we can't uh, necessarily say something about the absolute level of of spreads. You know whether the dealer is, is charging large is charging large rents. Um, and I understand. Uh, and my my thought is mostly to uh, ex is there an ability for the customer to examine the value of the relationship by comparing what would happen if I did something different? And if they can't see the data, it's hard for the customer to evaluate that. So, um, you know, if you think about what uh, Mark said about, okay, well, maybe they're spreading a small portion of their volume to other deals to test them out. I, 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 I mean, I, I did a paper a long time ago with Dan Bernhard when we, we pointed out this relationship thing in equities. And we looked at bilateral trading, but we didn't have individual institutions. So I applaud you for the wonderful data that you have. It's, it's great to be able to kind of see who is actually trading. We just saw it at the broker level. Um, but we could just capture the volume. But they could obviously go and look at at least trades of similar size did other people during the intraday get better prices than they did? So there was a way for anyone who had access to trade-by-trade uh, -trade data to do so. So in your talking to participants, uh, what do they say? Are they following up on this? I mean, ab absolutely. My, my impression is definitely that you know, large uh, institutional um, customers, you know, they care a lot about the, the execution quality. So, I, you know, definitely over time, you would imagine that they, they try to evaluate whether their relationship dealer is is providing them with, um, with 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 competitive prices, and I, so one direct way to do it. Recall that you know in these requests for a quote, right? They are getting um, prices from from dealers from multiple dealers at the same time. So a simple way to evaluate, and I think they they do this, is that well, if their relationship dealer is consistently not providing the best price. Then um, yeah, that's probably gonna gonna impact their their relationship with that dealer. You're, I love this uh, line of research, and I love what you're doing. This notion of relationships is so important. I'm just wondering, how do I bring someone into the relationship? Uh, sort of, there's a there's a an agreement here, if you will. And I'm going to give you a better price and you always come to me. So don't I have to start giving people the better prices early? Or do I just tell them if you become this level, I'm going to give you better prices? Uh, sort of Ingrid, it's related to Ingrid's point about verification. You're giving me a promise. And, and her point is good that I have to verify it. I'm even thinking of like, how do you advertise it? How do you bring people into a relationship? Do you just tell them I'm going to give you better prices? And do you provide a mechanism for verification of the better prices? Like what's the whole customer acquisition strategy implied uh, by this view? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you. That's, it. That's a really interesting question. Maybe one thing I should mention is that, you know, I, I talked about the these salespeople who manage the relationship with the customer. Actually, in many cases, it's the, the customers will rely on the salespeople to do a sort of um, execution quality analysis because obviously the, the salespeople are you know, placed within the dealer and have access to a lot of market prices. So and they typically know the markets quite well. And um, so in, in some cases, anecdotally speaking, I've, I have know of instances where if the salesperson is seeing that their customers are getting bad, you know, poor, poor prices, let's say within government bonds, then they'll tell their customer, don't, uh, you know, don't come us for government bonds. The traders don't provide competitive prices, and uh, I think that's motivated by you know the the salesperson. They keep their their customer through their whole career, so they really want to do you know do good by by the customers. Um, and yes, yeah, just you know a slightly different point. I think it's it's an, it's an interesting point what you mentioned. You know, how do these relationships start? What what happens at the beginning of the relationship? So again, that's 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 on our to-do list to to again understand the dynamics and and yeah see how the relationship are initiated. Thanks. Hi, Marcus. Good to Hi. see you again. 
Yes, I have a quick question. I, I'm very intrigued by your results, which are very interesting. The two things that I found intriguing is first, you show that clients with stronger relationship receive lower bid ask spreads. It sounds to suggest the smaller profit for the dealer and lower cost for the client. And then you have another result that show that uh, those clients have bids that have less overbidding. So it sounds like there's more profit for the winning dealer but that doesn't translate into so sort of smaller sort of profit for the clients. So I, I find it very interesting, but these three results, maybe you can clarify a little bit. Yeah, so I think the, the way we think about it is, um, just going back to the, the underlying mechanism is, which is you know, how many quotes is the, is the customer uh, receiving? So we think that you know, if, if, if the customer and the dealer can agree on a certain level of, of, of quote shopping, this increases the, the pie, essentially it creates value for, for both the customer and the dealer. And then the dealer can, can pass on um, part of the increase in the pie through, through better prices, through lower bid ask spreads. Um, so, and one thing we're working on right now is to, to try to quantify these different parts that, that will maybe sort of go to your question a little bit to understand the the, the the magnitudes um yeah to make it more clear uh, how much of, of of the gain in 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 value is passed on to the customer but, uh, thanks for your question but it, couldn't you view all of this as a price discrimination process that high volume really great companies could shop and get better prices so i'm just giving them the better prices they could get somewhere else it goes sort of my search slash uh switching cost model Right. In other words, you run the causality from lower prices to more volume. I'm wondering if it's just the other way around. These are very high volume active participants in the market who can get better prices because of their market power. Therefore, you have to offer them a slightly better price just to keep them there. Not, not as favorable a view as this, but kind of a realistic view of, of price discrimination. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. I, I guess the... When looking at the data, one 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 clash with with the the story you just uh, proposed there is that the customers with a, a low ranking per RFQ uh, request quotes from more dealers. So you would actually expect that you know these these customers are you know are are you, the dealer would have to compete even harder right to 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 get their business. And, and furthermore, we're arguing that they also, you know, secretly uh, get quotes from 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 dealers. So, so I, I guess you know that at least from 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 our point of view, the data suggests that there is a, a low relationship ranking. Those customers really are receiving quotes from a lot of dealers. So, um, no, I don't think it's quite um, consistent with you know that those customers then are. Yeah, have have less access and therefore receive worse prices. Well, you uh, can think of let's say um, you're a contractor building a house, and um, for something that's very much a commodity, you send out a lot of bids. But if you're the biggest contractor in the city, everyone knows they really want to work with you. So you can probably just get bids from one or two people, and you know there's no way they're going to give you a worse price, or they're not going to give you, in fact, a slight discount. So. I actually see that as consistent with my story. If if you don't have much market power, then you're shopping around all the time. If you know you're the big, you know, the big player and you can get great prices, then you say, fine, you know, Marcus, I know you. As long as you give me the best price, I'm not going to shop around. And it's that's it, but there, what's driving the discount is my size and ability to get better prices elsewhere rather than some kind of a trade-off of the pie. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. Um, I mean, anecdotally, the dealer tells us actually the lower rank customers tend to be more hedge funds. So, you know, certainly quite sophisticated, whereas the, the high rank customers are more very large pension funds, which to some extent is, is consistent with your story. But yeah, so right now we, we're also trying to get the, the specific data on, you know, which type of uh, institution each customer is, and that that might um, you know be able to to get further at the alternative hypothesis you're, you're suggesting there. Some interesting, Thanks. fantastic yeah. work. 
Yeah, some interesting aspects may come, come out of looking at dynamics of their relationships over time. So if you see someone who's switching uh, the bulk of their volume to another dealer to try to see what prompted that and what came after. Uh, so maybe you can, because you have quite a bit of a time series, maybe you can exploit that a bit in trying to sort of support the stories that you have in mind and uh, discriminate between those and alternatives. So just looking at the paths around switching, I think someone suggested that perhaps in the chat earlier. So, but really great work, interesting paper. Thank you. Thanks for your your suggestion and the comments. Thanks, that's uh, I appreciate that a lot. Okay, last call for comments and questions. All right, if no one has anything else, let's uh, thank Marcus for a, a great presentation. And thanks to all of you for attending. And we hope to see you all in two weeks when Carol Comerton Ford will be presenting. Till then, have a good one. Thanks all. Thanks for the comments. See you.